Hello, welcome back to another episode of the European Tour Picks and Bets. I am Skylar Hoke. I'm joined by Tom Jacobs. Tom coming off a high last week, absolutely nailed the Alfred Dunhill links. How are you celebrating, my friend? Well, so I'm bobbing my head up and down like a nodding dog. I don't know if you know <laughs> Churchill, the nodding dog advert in the UK, but that is what he does. Um, yeah, it was great. You know, Danny Willett, superb all round. Uh, great weekend. Never looked in trouble, really. Yes, I know Bland tied for the lead. Lagergren, who comes second, was attacking him, but never looked like he was going to give it up. So but there was a guy in the comments that sort of said that, you know, uh, never quite made your mind up on Danny Willett. I guess I talked about him quite a lot. I guess I probably wasn't as convincing on him as I was some of the shorts picks. So take that on board. But end of the day, you know, he was 100 to 1. I told you why he was good and uh, got away with it. So there we go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, He's somebody that's just more, more or less, we know the talent's there. The number gets out of reach at times to, you know, a, a battable situation. I feel like there's a golfer this week that I'll talk about a little bit later. That's like, okay, if there's life, a little bit of life, potentially you can just buy in because you know, he's came through in the big moments. You also like Lagergren quite a bit who uh, played exceptional. That course form continued for him. So congrats to you on a big week. I just love that tournament. And also we were proven wrong by the Ryder cup fatigue. Um, oh, you know, all 100%. three of those guys top 10 and just played exceptional. Like didn't miss a beat. No, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I said it on my podcast, just gone. Absolutely happy to be wrong on it. Like you just, you, you have to take a stance before the week's out. The best thing I guess I can say is none of them won. So there is, I guess, a, you know, yeah. a, a kind of room for maneuver in a sense that, you know, they're all short prices, didn't win. So and you, you need them to win at 14, 16, 18 to 1 for it to be worth it. So um still happy just to, you know, that I didn't go that way, obviously. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have ended up on Willet. Um, but when I actually look back, it, it was purely like people ask me, how did you get on him? What there was, what was it? And I said there was a bit of hidden form, but it was mainly just hundreds of one on links. Like, yeah. and sometimes like you're going to come on to later on one of your picks, you just have to draw a line in the sand. This is a big price. He's shown signs of life somewhere. And, I, and I, when I look back on it, I didn't realize quite how much he's been ill. Like he's had COVID this year. He's had appendicitis. He's had some sort of tooth problem. Um, he, he's always had injuries. So throughout the year, he probably hasn't really been healthy. And he finally gets a week where he's healthy, happy. And it was his birthday. He enjoyed the company of Jimmy Dunn. And, and away we go. Hundreds yeah. one, we're happy. Yep. Yeah. Um, that caddy of his as well has had quite a run at Alfred Dunhill Links being the past winner too, right on Beergard's bag yeah. um, in the past. So um, pretty neat week for them. But we move on to Spain here. We come a little bit of a Spain swing. I would say this event leading off, we haven't seen the Open de España since 2019 when John Rahm also won it there. He is coming back this week. Um, it's really a basis of can you tempt the beast? I mean, his number of course is not something that I know you or I, you know, at plus 225 or plus 300 where some of them open. like, I, I don't bet golf, let alone, you know, 10 to one realistically, you know, two and a half to one definitely passing uh, at that, but that doesn't mean he might not win by, by 12 strokes. It's very hard just to make a negative. There's only one real negative is that he's still not a golfer that tends to do that great off of a miscut. Um, you know, that's, that's about it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, 16 European Tour regular events. He's won six times. Uh, he's won this event back to back. Um, you know, he, he's too good. But if, if John Rahm turns up, the next guy in the field is Bernd Wiesberger. Well, that says everything you need to know. You know, he he's streets above everyone. He's, he's basically been streets above most people on the PJ Tour for the last however many months. So to do it on the European Tour as well, it... You know, if he turns up, we are playing for second, but I still think there's plenty of value in, in coming second. And there is trying to, what are you going to get out of betting John Rahm to win that you can get even Wiesberger finishing in the top five is is better than than Rahm winning. Yeah, and that's where I guess our, our strategies always kind of align. Even if our picks aren't, it is searching for the each way value or searching for just, it's hard to win a golf tournament. You know, as, as you know, even if it's a 33% chance or a 30% chance that, you know, Rahm's projected to win this week, there's still a 70% likelihood that somebody else in that field is going to be winning. Um, so we're going to take that. And, and I actually think when we look into this opening range um, of golfers beyond Wiesberger and Rahm, I mean, if John Rahm's not here, of course, it does make a significant difference. If it's, Tommy Fleetwood versus John Rahm, it makes a difference. But the fact that we have a very informed 
Masahiro Kawamura. And we have the greatest Italian golfer of all time, you know, sitting above 30 to one. I, I, I'm loving that. I, I think that's a very great start, you know, to a card. So, so sell us on why you're continuing to bet Kawamura. I mean, we, we've spoken about him, haven't we, for, for months now. T to green, he's just absolutely superb. Um, he was seventh here, I believe, on debut. And he was living with John Rahm on the par fives, which is no mean feat in itself. Um, had that, I think he was eighth at Valderrama as well. So he's shown it on both sides. Played pretty well at the the low scoring events back in Gran Canaria in Tenerife. You know, if you look at his location for him, he just, he loves playing in Spain. Um, the obvious knock is that he hasn't won. Um, everyone's got to win somewhere. Like it's going to happen. Um, I don't really like dealing in those certainties, but I think he will win. Uh, 45, he was sort of 50 to one earlier. Uh, I really like Mas- uh, Masahiro Kawamura. Yeah, uh, I, he finds himself in a lot of equal opportunities, which I love, of course. You know, you mentioned that in the par fives. They can continue that. But yeah, it's just a relative bet of of form versus number versus one big golfer in the field. I mean, Kawamura has been as good as anybody, you know, when it comes to the, the last stretch of golf. So can see that. Um, I was impressed with Guido last week, you know, after I, I called him out. You know, I said, you know, I don't even remember the harsh word. Maybe, maybe disappointed, or it was or maybe t- was, no, it was worse than that. I remember yeah. being shocked, but yeah, I mean, I can't remember the exact terms. Yeah, but. um, I don't know if I want to bring myself back to that that spot. You know, I'm sorry, Guido. It was you, you showed up. You know, you showed up last week. Except you, the most tilting thing about like shot tracking, Guido, is the dude bogeys 18 more than anybody I've honestly ever seen in my life. He did it in two rounds last week, Thursday and Friday, I believe it was. Friday was on a par five. He bogeyed the last one. If you saw his shot on 18, Instagram and Facebook are down right now, so you're not be able to see videos unless they tweet it out. But um, Guido, he on the 18th hole on Sunday, hit a driver so far right that it ricocheted off of the house, bounced on the sidewalk multiple times, back to regulation. It's just something about him not finishing around that, you know, leaves a little bit for me, but there was enough there, of course, to go back in 35 to one. I mean, again, I just going to attack the opportunity that he is better than that number. Um, and in this field, I think he's probably, you know, with Kawamura, the third best golfer. I mean, Callum Hill probably has a right to, to it as well. Um, but I think right there, Guido can can go through it. And if it comes out of nowhere. So I, I can go on and on, but I think 35 to 1 is incredibly fair. I think also we, we spoke about there's going to be a without John Rahm market at some yes. point out of thought. And you, you kind of, if you're obsessed with the fact that John Rahm is going to win, then of course you want to play in there. I'm just going to play these guys in the outright because I think John Rahm can be beat. I don't think anyone can just keep going on. This name's Tiger Woods. Um, and although he's probably Tiger Woods in the context of this field, he isn't Tiger Woods. So um, I'm happy just to take a chance in the big rubs. Yep. Um, that's kind of where I'm living too. Now, um, two different golfers, two extremely young golfers, um, both of us, are going to go with in this next stretch here. One who continued his excellent play uh, with another top 10. It is no longer Matthias Schmidt. I don't know if you saw this, Tom, on the update. It's Matty. Matty. Matty Schmidt. And I love it. I love that. Ends with an I, too. It's that's, not that's a Y. You know you're a you player, know? yeah. Yes, Matty Schmidt. I am definitely in on him. We knew, um, you know, German kid came out strong. I believe Louisville, um, you know, did really, really well getting his um, teeth really cut um, from initially qualifying for the U S open and that really difficult uh, Texas qualifier. And then just flashes on the European tour. Um, and then also on the challenge tour. So he's ripped off back to back, great finishes 50 to one, you know, he's hung around. I, I think it's enough there right with your selection that both of them are, are in some great form. One of course is doing it more on bigger tours um, with a victory, but I think Schmidt is a incredible talent. Um, there's another uh, really good talent. I think that's deeper down the field, but Schmidt has played enough in these events to deserve where his odds are. And at some point I think he's going to break through. Yeah. I mean, this is upside, right? You know, I think Jeff mentions it on, on Pat's show and just show that they, they you're betting on the upside of a golfer and, and he, he's got it in abundance, right? You know, he was the low amateur at, at the Open. He only finished 59th, but he was a low amateur. And everyone was always going to back him the next time he teed it up. And, you know, he did okay. He was 47th, and then he was 19th after that. 
took him a little while to get back into the routine. But like you say, he's gone ninth, second, ninth now in his last three starts, four top 11s, his last five events across the, the Challenge Tour and European Tour. And, and it's easy to look at the Challenge Tour form and go, that's not European Tour form, but he can only play where he plays, right? You know, whatever he's got status in, whatever field he plays in, he has to play well that week. And and he's done it. So I really do like Matthias Schmid. The only reason I really, I didn't even oppose him, but the reason I, I didn't go for him is because I'm sort of living in this this part of the odds balls for everyone else. And uh, Nikolai Hoygaard was 50 to 1. Like, I just don't, I don't understand. Like, is Callum Hill significantly better than Nikolai Hoygaard? Is is Bernd Wiesberger currently, you know, significantly better than him in terms of current form? I know he's had a good season. Um, and he's obviously been to the Ryder Cup. And if you just look at the last five starts, 21st, 17th, win, 20th, 14th. Other than the wins, I think all of those could have been a slightly better, a bit of better short game as well. Fourth in the Canary Islands, 14th in the Kazoo Open. I think there's probably been a little bit too much stuck to that miscut he had here on debut. He was 18 yeah. years of age. He's mm-hmm. still only, he's still only 20, and he didn't even have a bad round. He just didn't keep up with the scoring. This is going to be... I think if you look at like Valderrama, you might go, okay, well, there's potential for him to blow up. He's not that mature, blah, blah, blah. This is, there's no rough. It's going to be low scoring. T to green is so important. And that's just right in Hoygaard's wheelhouse. So you've got Nikolai on this side of the pond and Rasmus on the other side. It'd be interesting yes. to see who finishes high. I'm excited for Rasmus this week in mm. Vegas. Um, should be another good course fit. And yeah, I think we didn't really dive into the course, you know, all that much either, but it does seem one that you can rather attack. Uh, you know, off the tee. I mean, Rom, you know, kind of overpowered it in his times here, but, um, you know, excited for them. I think another golfer we'd be remiss not to talk about after we mentioned him last week on our betting cards. Um, Sean Crocker, unfortunately, withdrew after round one last week. You had a little insight into that. Looks like he should be fine teeing up. Yeah, so I think he's, he's potentially ruptured a tendon in his foot. He was going for an MRI over the weekend. Uh, I haven't had any further information on that other than apparently he said he was fine. Um, you know, so he's flown out. He seems to be okay. Um, I personally won't bet on him this week. One, because I want to see if anything else comes out on his foot. But also, I think Valderrama might be better for him. Like, I think he might prefer it tougher where his ball striking yes. just comes to the fore. I'm just hoping he has a middling week mm-hmm. at a similar price because he's got to make a ton of putts this week to to win. Um, and as much as I love Sean Crocker's game, that is his weak part. So yeah. you, you do have to uh, consider that the type of event it is. Yeah, I, I really like Crocker at Valderrama. Um, that's, I mean, that's where he almost broke through, what, two years ago, right? Him and Lipsky were up there when Campillo um, ended up coming through on the Sunday. Um, but yeah, um, looking forward to to next week uh, for the big boy test. But um, before we go deeper into the picks, want to make sure always we mention um, our audio formats you can find us on. So Daily Fantasy Sports Picks and Bets, The Mix. If you subscribe to that on any of your different audio um, you know, podcasts that you listen to, uh, make sure you subscribe to us on there. Give us a rate, review. We would love that. We could appreciate your support. Um, and we move on down um, a little bit deeper into the range. Now, both of us kept our cards, at least from selections today, a little bit lighter. Um, for me, it is anticipation of, you know, what John Rahm does bring to this field. But, um, you know, I just think me personally, I'm trying to tighten it up a little bit. I haven't been able to really come through with a lot of selections uh, over the time period. I should have just kind of tailed you a little bit more recently, Tom, here. But um, let's look into a couple long shots or a couple, I guess, deeper odds that you're you're uh, you're confirmed on. Yeah, I mean, before we go to that, I mean, Justin Harding as well is is someone that I do really like. I think that he was seventh here on his debut, third at Valderrama uh, last year, back to back top 15s in Grand Canary and Tenerife. So I think he's a guy that can get to that scoring level. So for me, it was Caramore or Harding and Hoygaard at this kind of 40 to 51 range that I really liked. But... In terms of just real outsiders, I mean, Maximilian Kiefer, I kind of made a joke on Twitter earlier saying, when are they going to bet without Maximilian Kiefer? Um, he just absolutely loves playing in Spain. I mean, it's I don't know if you would go back as far as, as when he used to play. He played in that monster playoff with Rafael Jacqueline. He, it went for hours, and they, they were just collapsing on the floor every time both of them matched each other on the score. Um, but he was second then. He had a fifth, ninth, a twelfth, a fifth, a seventeenth, and a second since then in Spain. Like, he just loves this part of the world. Um, so I always think it's worth backing someone like Kiefer 
Um, and he was 175 to one this morning. I don't quite know the prices he is now, um, but I think he was, I think it was Grand Canary, wherever Higo won. Um, when Higo shot a 63 yep. in the final round, Kiefer shot a 62, um, and he just didn't have as much earlier in the week as Higo did. So for me, Kiefer looks a great, he's in good, good form as well. Good current form. He's had a couple of top 25s, I think recently as well. Yeah. 175 to one. Um, he almost ripped the heart out for two of those outrights we hit earlier in the year with that marathon playoff versus John Catlin too. Yeah. Um, and then chasing down or trying to chase down Derek Higo, the goat, uh, in the Canary Islands. So, um, the one I went with, and this, this feels super speculative to me. Um, and it's, it's still 80 to one and, and perhaps, I think I'm a little bit of sucker. So if you go on the European tour um, website from stats last week, um, I, we could talk this conversation out right now. Um, maybe tour tips potentially had a little bit more insight too, but from a strokes gain perspective, there was two different ways that it was happening at, at the Alfred Dunhill links at the old course at St. Andrews. They were having shot link, yeah, have, right having shot yeah. tracker. So if you made the cut, you should have two rounds for sure from St. Andrews. However, they were also at the additional courses using caddies that were taking notes and handing in like they used to on the European tour. That's how we got the original strokes gain statistics. So there's ranging. This is where it gives me trouble though, Tom, there was two rounds, three rounds, four rounds. So two rounds would have meant you made the cut and your caddy didn't submit three rounds would have meant your caddy submitted and you missed the cut four rounds, your caddy submitted and you made the cut. However, all golfers have at least two rounds of strokes gain data, according to the website, which doesn't make sense because not the other courses didn't have it. So I am questioning the strokes gain data just a little bit from last week. Yeah. So my understanding was that everyone played three rounds because it was a 54 hole cut. So if there isn't three rounds of data for everybody, you're slightly concerned about the people that had two. Yes. Um, I think the guys that had four, I'd be pretty confident about. Um, and I, I sent out a newsletter, all the strokes gain data that I had. And like you, I'm a little bit concerned by it. Um, I think, you know, a guy that you're going to come on to, um, Christopher Brobrad had an outstanding week, uh, strokes gain approach. Um, and as did your long shot as well. So it, it does remain to be seen how accurate it was, but given their places on the leaderboard and their couple of low rounds, I wouldn't be surprised if they are accurate. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. They, they also had strong finishes. I mean, in, in talking about Broberg, he, he made every putt under the sun two weeks ago when he got over the line, but you could see and feel that emotion for him and how important that was. I mean, the guy was a winner, like, you know, in, in previous building up, um, you know, kind of to where he got to his best status you know, in the world. I mean, he won four times in 2012, you know, alone. And that was in 15 events played. Um, and not, not all of them, of course, you know, four of them all on the challenge tour there, but that, that's incredible to, to rip those off and, and kind of have that degree in your, um, you know, bag to do that. So to see him win one way, then to see him top 10 in a more difficult field, with it being driven by the irons and i'm trying to confirm was was his two or four rounds do we do we have his, that his was his was four rounds okay. um he i do have it here somewhere i did see as well it was it was driven by sunday sunday was very good with the irons right so it says that he had almost 13 strokes gained with his irons yes uh, over the four rounds and i think like you say, a ton of that would have been on Sunday. He shot uh, 64 or 65. Yeah, he gained three point. I guess this is adjusted, but he gained three around three strokes uh, yeah. on his irons alone on Sunday. And then on Saturday, he also he gained right about two and a half. So he had a heck of a weekend um, at the old course. I'm assuming he played both. I think it was old course, old course. So, yeah. you know. And that's enough for me to, to make a speculative bet after winning two weeks ago at 80 to one, maybe the monkey's off his back, feeling good to come back after that emotional win to, to top 10, a, a much stronger event. Um, I'm willing to risk it. Roll the dice 80 to one. I think what happens after a win for any goal for is very telling. Right. And I think that Broberg was, he broke down after his win. He was in blood to tears, couldn't speak and actually finish his interview. Um, because he's just had a horrendous time of it since 
winning last, right? And but when you actually look at his year long form, I mean, he had a 16th at the Abu Dhabi Championship, he had a 12th at the Scandinavian Mixed at home, 37th at the BMW International Open. It wasn't just a complete flash in the pan. I mean, the concern was that he just made every part he ever looked at, but you still have to you have to get the ball to the holes and make the putts, right? I mean, it, it, to set up the amount of birdie chances that he did, he has to get the ball on the green. So he then finishes eighth at the links. And my concern is always how someone goes from a links event to, you know, a parkland track like this with, but again, there's no rough. There's no real restrictions on the tee. Um, he's not going to have to hit driver an awful lot if he doesn't want to. So there's no reason he can't keep the run of form going. I just, I liked guys that had had more, form in spain just in general that was just how i took the approach to this event yeah yeah and i don't think there's anything wrong with with either side of kind of our argument i mean if you tell me christopher brogue were top 10 event after his win losing four strokes putting i would have said no chance you know what i mean what, what are you talking about so you maybe you combine the two and he's the he's john rock you know maybe that's what we get this weekend uh we go toe-to-toe with the world's best i have one more selection um very speculative that I'm on, but um, who are you rounding your card out before we mention some flyers potentially on DraftKings? Yeah, so Skier is Seagrass for me. And I, I, that is, I mean, you're the guy with the mispronunciations. That's how I'm going for it this week. Um, I was worried. I, I don't want him to say that one. No, he he's French, which again, does, the name doesn't really give it away, but he is French. Um, but he's played a lot of decent golf in Spain. He's 12th at Tenerife, 22nd in the Canary Islands earlier in the year, 17th at Valderrama. Uh, last year and he opened with a 77 that week as well and he was third in the Andalusia match play um, on the challenge tour as well so just looking at a guy that that likes the part of the world and that is a I guess risky strategy that you're just going to keep tailing the guys that have played well uh, in Spain but just looking you know he's 38th at the Dutch Open 18th at Gran Cerciere for the European Masters and he's now made you know five straight cuts on the European tour so for a guy that's not the most consistent and now returning to his favorable part of the world, I just thought, I think he was 200 to one. I thought it was a decent, decent number. Yeah. Yeah. He's somebody I feel like often it's just kind of a round basis where he's popped quite a bit. Um, so excited for him. The one that I'm landing on, oh, it, feel, it feels really bad to like publicly say this, <laughs> but how was how Tong Lee all of a sudden, you know, on a fr- front page of a leaderboard? Did that not catch everybody's eye? I mean, he has been miserable. Like, whatever I said about Guido last week, like, time's up by 10, and that's what Hao Tong I think, know, has been. I think because of the – so the, the PJ Championship. Uh, yeah, that's uh, what it is. It goes back to Harding Park. Yeah. Harding Park, right. And Sky Sport – I mean, I don't know what the coverage was like over there, but Sky Sports were just absolutely nailing this guy – for just spending hours on the range there. Like, I can't believe he keeps doing it. He's going to lose himself. What a waste of time. He's just overdoing it. Blah, blah. He just wasn't comfortable in his game at the time. And he was still somewhere up on the top of the leaderboard. And because that feels so recent still, I think, because we've still kind of not got out of this pandemic, whatever, it has been a long time since that golf tournament. And he has been awful. Like, not even a little bit. I wrote in the newsletter that this was, he'd not made a cut in 2021 he had 14 previous starts and then he goes and finishes 14th this week and my only concern sky is that it's just the links factor like I've, sure. seen him, I've seen him play incredibly well at open championships i've seen him play well and done here links in the past and it's such a different event these fairways are like runways um the ball just chases the putts are great because there's 400 mile greens shared greens whatever um but Again, there isn't so much pressure off the tee. And yeah. that's what's that's what and I think he put up an Instagram. He's he's looking forward to hitting bombs again. You know, he's absolutely mm-hmm. loving his life. Um, he's got the upside for sure. Yeah, and I mean he's still I mean it's it's deserved where he's priced at, but I mean 200 to one as well, still available. It's just enough. I mean, we saw Biergard have a similar transition back to some form. I mean, heck, Tom, we were betting Gavin Green off of very similar things. You know, I mean, maybe he does have the Gavin Green that, you know, (laughs) plus 10 first round. Like, that that could absolutely be in the bag, too. Um, But 
I mean, two out of his four rounds, I think he had what a 64 and a 68. He opened with the 64, closed with the 68. Um, yeah. his approach was very, very good. Um, it's just speculative, it's super speculative, but how Tong has won massive events before that. I think it's worth at least chancing if he's somewhat back. I think you have to, it's pretty much your position on how Tong Lee is a golfer, right? If you think that, like I did with Beauregard, and like you did with Beauregard as well, if you think the upside of these golfers is an elite level, let's say top 50 golfer in the world that can, you know, contend on the PJ Tour on random weeks, right? That's probably the level. Then you back him because find out this week whether it was a fluke last week at 200 to 1. If it wasn't, he's going to be 50 to 1. Yeah. And if it was, he's going to be 500 to 1. You never have to bet him again. So yeah. I think it's a pretty easy bet to make. I mean, he was at the top of my winners list this week, finishing 14th out of nowhere. Um, love to see it. You know, like you say, he's won the Desert Classic. He's won uh, where else? Volvo China Open back at home. And third in the Open Championship, I think he shot 63 in the final round that yep. year. So mm-hmm. in in pretty rough conditions. So he's great. Yeah. I, I, it's worth chancing for that comeback that could come out of nowhere while the number is still available. That it is. You're exactly right. So as we've been talking, DraftKings salaries have um, been released. So I want you to go through, and this is what's hysterical. Maybe this is going to be changed by the time you listen to this. We've already confirmed, you know, John Ram is in the field. He's in the entry list. Everything's completely normal. I, maybe I thought they were toying with me because I may be one of the biggest customers when it comes to the European tour DFS on DraftKings, but they price Guido Migliazzi number one, <laughs> 11,100. I'm like, all right, these guys are on my side. They know he should be the favorite this week. They know it. They're just toying with me. Well, I keep scrolling. They forgot to price John Rahm. There's no John Rahm right now on DraftKings. He is on their odds board. So I'd imagine potentially we get an addition of him in. I mean, again, Guido's 11,100. Are we going to see like 13K Rom in this one? I don't know. Maybe they don't add him. Maybe it's more fun if they don't. I might prefer it that way. Um, so I don't have to make that decision. Do you, do you play him or not? Um, but let's talk through a couple of the guys that you like, and I'll rattle off their DraftKings salary back to you um, from kind of your, your extra list. Let's have a look at some of the, the, the larger figures. Fabrizio Zanotti. Zanotti, 8,100. See, again, this field is so different without John Rahm. You know mm. what I mean? Like, 8,100 is expensive probably to play for Zanotti. But JB what, Han- back-to-back top 30s? Yep, J.B. Hansen. Hansen, he is. He's cheap, 7,700. Yeah, I like that. I think he's great. He plays excellent golf in Spain. Mm-hmm. Uh, Wilco Nienaba. I liked what Wilco did last week. Um, Wilco, 7,300. And in fact, I... I will I will mention him as a as a hundred I think he's 110 to 100 to one I think he's a, a really good bet because he can do what John Rahm did to this golf course where he can just overpower it and yep. he finished sixth at Valderrama as well so he can do it on a tight golf course. Yep. Um. So yeah, I think he's a great pick at 100 to one. Yep. Let's look further down the list. Matthew Pavon. Pavon, you like Pavon? Um. Let's see. Pavon, 6900. Keep getting cheaper and cheaper. You got to like that. This guy has to be cheap. So he is the, his top 25 this week is the first in like two years. Thomas Aiken. Aiken, Aiken, Aiken. 6,400. You're working our way down here, Tommy boy. Yeah, I mean, he is. He, he's worth a go. He's worth a chance. Okay. Um, Sky, any for you that, you know? I got one. I got one only. You, you guys should know me well enough to know where this one is. If you are spending your Saturdays and Sundays looking at the entry list, one thing, I seriously, I do it every single week and I get excited because I I do love the amateur game. Like, you know, seeing these golfers come up and they get opportunities on the European tour. So when I'm, when I'm loading in the field, getting my research done, it's so much fun to, to like not know these golfers very well and then be able to check out the, the Wagger list, go check out how they're doing. Maybe Jeff Sagarin's college rankings, um, but this one is kind of a household name of, of amateur golfers right now. And they were priced them correctly in the outright market. David Puig, um, I think you'd pronounce it Puig, like Yasiel Puig in the, in the NFL or the, the MLB. Um, but Puig is, um, I think he's number five right now in the Wagger rankings. He has had an exceptional collegiate year. Um, his last three 
I guess last two collegiate events went second and third. Those were in September. He also was third at the European Amateur Championship not that long ago. His first two events of the year were wins, one of them coming at the Southwestern Invitational, which is a massive um, event. Didn't do, do well in the USAM Championship, but um, he's got some, some talent. So David Puig is $6,900 this week on DraftKings. Absolutely going to be loading up on him. I wonder if he's in relation to Ricky Puig, who plays for Barcelona. Could be. Mm. Um, what you do with amateur golfers, Sky, which is commendable. You know, you find these 14-year-old schoolboys and, and they come out and play European school for the first time. It reminds me of, I don't know if any of our listeners will play Football Manager, the kind of simulation game. Okay. And you take over a team in like the fourth league of the Danish football thing. And you, you end up traveling to the country and getting a jersey because you fall in love with this right winger that they had at 17 years of age. That just, that strikes me as what you would do. You'll get fully invested in them. Uh, and it's great. You know, um, you know, Puig, I've not heard an awful lot about him, but I trust your judgment. There's two names that I'll probably mention before we wrap it up. Yep. Luke Donald was impressive last week at Dunhill Links. Again, I think maybe it just helps that he was playing with a friend and, you know, that kind of helps there. Um, and then it was the guy that was it John Murphy, the guy that played so well. Yes, yes, Olympics. I wanted to bring him up too. That's a good one. Yeah. He, he, him, and Schmidt both got the uh, invitations because they had top tens in the event. Yeah, and I believe did he played Walker Cup as well, John Murphy. Yeah, he might be a bet, Tom. What's his What's his odds? Let's see. He is one hundred and sixty to one. I don't mind that because if you look at what he was. 11th i think he had he struggled on sunday um he did yeah no he finished after him but he also had a recent really good um he did really struggle on sunday though this past sunday. he was 11th on the challenge tour wasn't he the big yes big um 60 65 uh final round there um speaking of on the challenge tour did you see alejandro del rey last week 58 50 boy can play and I think it was Kip Henley that tweeted out that he choked it down the last because he made a load of pars coming in. He started on the 10th and eased yes. his last hole. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. that, and your your man, uh, Liggy Diggy. Um, oh, I didn't he, want to bring it up. Yes. One win away. He's blind. Yeah. One win away. Uh, auto, I mean, he's going to be in the European tour next year, but um, auto promotion. There's a lot of guys that are fighting. Uh, Schneider, I thought, was going to get the auto promotion after he played really well through 36 last week. Yeah, Yannick Ricardo. Paul looks like he's going to lock up a card. Uh, Guive, right? Guive, yeah. And yeah, I mean, there's there's going to be a ton of talent. You know, this feels like a, I think because they've had that extra time to qualify for the European Tour with, with the, what's going on. I think they're going to be some some deep talent next year. Yeah. Um. Speaking of the other one that could is Santiago, Santiago Tario, who was in the field this week as well. Um. Uh, Eighty to one, not bad for him after um he didn't play too well, uh last week. But no, I'm, I'm excited for this event. Um, it's kind of a precursor to what next week is really going to be. Uh, right. Absolutely love Eldorama. And with that, too, um, you're going to have a new co-host the next two weeks. Taking off on a little vacay. Um, it's already a year since me and my wife have been married. We hadn't really get to celebrate any sort of. Thank you. We didn't really get to have a honeymoon. So we're going on a little anniversary trip out to Hawaii. So um, looking forward Very to nice. a couple of weeks off listening to our friends on here with you. Um, but but look, always look at the guy that wins more golf bets out of the two of us. If one of us goes to Hawaii, I'm staying in Kenton, England, uh, hey, for the remainder of the year. Rumor has it you're going to NYC, uh, in uh, 2021. And so, if we have any of our listeners out there, Tom, let, let's get Tom a couple of drinks out in New York yeah, City. Yeah, I am suffering the, the, the New York Jets, which Tim will be excited about, and I'll also be seeing uh, the New York Rangers as well. So, that'd be cool. Nice, so, awesome. Yeah. Well, I always appreciate you. I'll miss you for the couple of weeks. I am gone. Congrats again on the Will It Hit last week. Let's go back through your card one more time as we close up. Yep. So Masahiro Kawamura, I think it's 45, 40 to 1. Uh, Justin Harden and Nikolai Hoygaard at 50 to 1. Hoygaard, probably my, my favorite pick of the week. I didn't mention Adrian Aus, but again, I, I think you just have to limit who you're taking there. Maximilian Kiefer, 175 to 1. Skio Seagrest, uh, 200 to 1. And I like Wilco at nine neighbor as well, 100 to 1. Yeah, I think um, the the conviction picks that I had, my four, Guido Migliazzi at 35, Matthias Schmid at 50, Christopher, Christopher Broberg at 80s, Hatong Lee, 200. I'm going to do a little bit deep dive into your kind of conviction ones as well. I think uh, Kiefer and Wilco, I wouldn't be surprised if I end up rounding up on them. John Murphy, I'm going to dig into that a little bit too. 
um, kind of see his talent at those numbers, but excited for the week. Um, if you want to play DraftKings again, John Romless DraftKings, uh, looking forward to that. Is the, the contests are a little bit bigger last week than I anticipated. So hopefully they, they beef them up for Valderrama next week. Absolutely. Cool. Well, best of luck, everybody. Thank you again for listening, and we'll see you next time.